<laughs> all right good morning everybody it's good to see you all right uh welcome welcome let's uh yeah let's do this next thing if we can Praise the Lord, everybody. It's good to see you this morning. All right, we took a short trip uh, down to Florida, but nobody wants to be in Florida. We just wanted to be here where the snow is and the ice and the misery. Um, but it is good to be home. So uh, it seemed like a long time ago since we last met. So I'm thrilled to be here this morning. We are in a series called Against All Odds. We are wrapping this up soon. We, we conclude this series next week. All right, I know... You might feel sort of silly, but if you have a palm leaf, can you give it a wave, all right? Everybody doesn't know what this is. Like, some of you have a palm leaf and you don't know why they, you were given this and you feel ridiculous, but everybody's doing it. All the popular kids are doing it, so you should just... That's a terrible reason, by the way, to do it because the popular kids are. Uh, but, it feels, but it does feel a little festive, doesn't it? For 28 years, Toy Petty's been making sure we've had enough palm branches for everybody. So it is Palm Sunday, and uh, we're going to talk about, we, uh, if you're just joining us, we've been uh, sharing about the, prophecy that were, the prophecies that were fulfilled in the last um, week of Jesus' earthly ministry before he went to the cross. And uh, this has been a little unusual. Uh, that includes today. We've had some, uh, some of these messages where we've just flown through uh, a lot of scripture, and um, I did get some positive feedback from, from, I don't know, a few weeks ago. We just, we had record numbers of scripture, but there, uh, people were saying it was great, but my head hurts. Um, it, was, it was so much, but we, where we talked about the trials that Jesus endured and the order that they went into, and, and so that kind of thing. So we're going to do a similar thing this morning as we are going to take a look at the last week and uh, you know we talked about good friday and we know there's different things that happened throughout the week and uh, i want to share with you the things that took place um, this week what is today marks the beginning of what has been called uh, traditionally holy week and so we've been looking at isaiah isaiah was 700 years before the earthly ministry of jesus you can tell i'm already talking really fast because i know what's in store so I'm already out of breath because I'm, I'm trying to move quickly. Um, but I want to take a, a moment today and look at uh, Zechariah, uh, another Old Testament prophet. He lived around 500 B.C., so he's a little more recent than Isaiah, but he's still ahead of Jesus' earthly ministry by centuries. 
And Zechariah said, and this is important to us to look at on Palm Sunday morning, Zechariah said, uh, through the inspiration of God's Spirit, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So that's the Old Testament prophecy that we want to look at this morning. That's the Old Testament prophecy that predicted what we call Palm Sunday or Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. So during Zechariah's ministry, during his days, the nation of Israel was rebuilding their city. They had been uh, um, dominated by a foreign nation, uh, foreign nations by this point, and the walls were, were broken down, and they were returning from exile from Babylon, and the walls of Jerusalem were still in ruins. So that's interesting uh, because the city had no gates. Zechariah talks about um, the Messiah coming through, uh, entering the gates or entering the city triumphantly. But yet Zechariah boldly prophesies that one day the Messiah, the king, would, would ride into the city. What are the odds that so many hundreds and hundreds of years prior to that, that he would be right? That that is the exact way that the Messiah would ride into the holy city of Jerusalem. And the donkey is significant. We'll talk about that here in just a little bit. So this marks the beginning of Holy Week. Um, um, and so we might, we might wonder, well, what was Jesus doing on, we know what, we kind of know what Palm Sunday is, but what happens on Monday? What happens on Tuesday? You know, what, what goes on? We've heard of Monday, Thursday. We'll talk a little bit about that here in, in a moment. My hope is that tomorrow you'll wake up and you'll go, uh, as you're reflecting, on the ministry of Jesus, and you go, I know what Jesus was doing on Monday. I, I know where he was at. I know what was going on. And Tuesday and, and on through the week. That's, that's kind of the idea. And uh, many of you may have received uh, a little sheet of paper, half sheet of paper, that has what was going on during this final week of Jesus' ministry. Anybody have the, have the paper? Anybody still need it? I think we've got some folks ready, armed, and equipped you don't need it for this morning, but as you're reflecting and, and uh, meditating on all that Jesus did and, and endured and went through this week, uh, we hope that that, that will kind of help you out. So what happened during Holy Week? Are you ready? All right. I wish the seats came supplied with seat belts because um, we, might, we might need them this morning. So what was Jesus up to? Uh, in the days leading up to Good Friday. So we'll take a few steps backwards, all right? Before we get to, uh, sorry, before we get to Palm Sunday. So Jesus had been traveling on his way to Jerusalem. This is where the cross was going to take place. And it took uh, a long time to get where he was ministering to Jerusalem. It took several weeks. And so, and, and imagine he's timing this just right because he's got to be crucified at Passover, on the Jewish Passover, right? So, He's, uh, he's timing things wisely and with incredible accuracy. Um, he uh, travels through shortly before Jerusalem. He travels through Jericho on his way. Uh, you might remember Jericho, that there's uh, a few Bible stories about Jericho that you might recall. And in Jericho, he has lunch with a fellow named Zacchaeus. Anybody remember Zacchaeus? He's a man of short stature, climbed up in the tree to see Jesus. Um, he's, uh, he's a bad guy. Nobody likes Zacchaeus. And Jesus says, today, I'm gonna have, we're going to have lunch together. We're going to spend some time together. And everyone is shocked. Salvation comes to Zacchaeus' home that day. So that is leading right up to um, where we are at in history here on Palm Sunday. So afterwards, after Jesus shares a meal with Zacchaeus, Jesus and his disciples hiked, um, I think the words here are interesting, a grueling ascent from Jericho to a small village two miles east of Jerusalem called Bethany. And so a lot of times, you know, some critics of the Bible say, well, you know, this city, it said that they went up to this city and this city was actually north of the city that they were going. So they actually were going south. Nah, Bible's inaccurate. And what they very often don't realize is that a lot of times, that was way weirder than I intended it to be. 
Is that we? Yeah, yeah. We'll make sure and have to watch that. Uh, watch that later. Um, uh, but a lot of times, it's they're traveling up, not because they're going north, but because the city is a higher elevation. And so, from where Bethany is, yeah, it's just weird. From where Bethany is, the uh, to travel from there to uh, ra- ra- sorry, where Jericho is at to travel from Jericho to Bethany, it is a grueling hike. Um, so they travel from Jericho to Bethany, which is two miles east of Jerusalem. So Bethany is the home, uh, some of you might recall, of Jesus' good friends, his buddy Lazarus and Lazarus', Lazarus his siblings named Mary and Martha. So Jesus had to make a 12-mile hike up to Bethany uh, before sundown on Friday. Um, in order to keep, you know, the Sabbath, right? You're not supposed to travel more than uh, two-thirds of a mile on the Sabbath. So once the sun sets, it's the Sabbath. And so it's likely that he finished his journey before uh, the Sabbath, or at least um, concluded his journey as, as the Sabbath, as the sun set. So they walked about 12 miles, which, come on, folks, that sounds pretty tough. That sounds hard. Like, right, like I don't want to walk a mile. I don't even want to do, I don't want to do... I don't want to do that. But it's 12 miles uphill, um, covering about a 4,000-foot vertical elevation in one afternoon until they arrived at Lazarus, Mary, and Martha's house. One scholar said that Jesus probably slept very well that evening, right? So, so kind of giving you a timetable prior to Palm Sunday, then we'll get to, then we'll get to Palm Sunday and Holy Week. So John says that six days before Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus was, the one Jesus had raised from the dead. I would love to get into this in more detail, but we don't have time this morning. But most of you know that Lazarus was a a great friend of Jesus, a very close friend of Jesus, and actually had passed away. And Jesus, um, one of the miracles that he performed was raising his friend Lazarus from the dead. That was significant in a number of ways, as we'll see here in just a moment. So six days before Passover. So when did, when did Easter happen? Um, that was on a, well, Easter. Um, better, I better say, when was Jesus crucified? It was on Passover. So this is six days before Passover. So that would have been the Sabbath. The Bible goes on to say that then Mary, um, Mary took a pint of pure nard. So he's with his friends. He's He's with his, his dear friends. That Mary took about a pint of pure nard and an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. So this is interesting. And I, I don't know. This, is a, this sounds in some ways difficult to believe. But in other ways, how many of you have noticed there's a lot of Marys in the Bible? So somebody said during this time, there's about 50% of Jewish women were named Mary. So it's a, it's a real popular name. They, they bought the baby books and, and the baby name books, and that was number one. So everybody was, everybody was doing it. It was, uh, it was really a, a, a name after Moses' sister Miriam. So we're not completely sure which Mary this was. Some believe it was Mary, the sister of Lazarus. Others believe it was Mary Magdalene. Not sure, but Mark tells us that the perfume that she poured on his feet was worth about an entire year's wages. So I'll just ask you, what, how, much did you how much did you make last year? You don't have to shout that out. It's, I'm not expecting an answer. Uh, 40000 50000 80000 more? Imagine taking a year's wages and, and giving them as a sacrifice to the Lord. You thought 10% was a lot, right? Um, And here Mary is anointing Jesus. He speaks uh, as her perfume and this uh, this act of worship that she performs, that she does, um, is an an incredible thing. And the room is stunned. All in attendance are stunned. Probably, so Mark says it was worth um, about a year's wages. But for Mary, it's probably her entire life savings. This is Jesus, after all, right? He's, how I many of you know, he's worth it, right? Amen. So Mary poured what was probably her entire life's savings on Jesus' feet as a way of honoring him and worshiping him. 
And Jesus doesn't respond like, hey, 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 take it easy, take it easy. I'm not worthy of this. He actually really more or less says that he's worthy of the worship and receives the adoration and the praise um, and accepts her gift in the spirit that it was given. John 12, 4 says, we could skip this, but I think it's interesting. Um, one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, you guys know Judas, who was later to betray him, objected. What a stinker, right? He objected. Why hasn't this perfume been sold and the money been given to the poor? It was, it was, it was worth a year's wages. So, you know, leave it up to, I mean, there's a lot of things we could say about it. Just leave it up to dirty old Lazarus to find a problem with this amazing, who did I say? Lazarus. Lazarus. No, Lazarus is the good guy. I'm glad you're here this morning, Jeffrey. So glad to see you. Always glad to see you, but especially when you correct me. There's a lot of names. There's a lot of things happening. I will need your help this morning. So you're, you're throwing out so much stuff. You're, you're throwing out so many things. You're, you're traveling so far in this message that it's kind of, I'm kind of having trouble. Let me tell you, friends, I need you this morning. This is, a, this, this is a team effort, right? Help me out. Who's the guy? Judas, right? Judas is the bad guy. Leave it to Judas. Lazarus, good guy. Judas, bad guy. Um, leave it to him to whine and complain about this act of worship. All right? Uh, Judas has something of a bad attitude. John goes on to explain he didn't say this because he cared about the poor. Right? A lot of times uh, people, you know, don't, don't give the real reasons uh, why, why they're saying or, or why they're against some generous act or benevolent act. They have some hidden agenda. Judas didn't like it, as John writes, because he was a thief. And as keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Like you thought betraying Jesus was where his, his evil started, right? Like he was a bad guy before that started. So, uh, let me give you in summary. This is for me as much as it's for you. Uh, on Saturday before Palm Sunday, the Saturday before Palm Sunday, Jesus eats dinner with his, with his friends, hangs out in their home, enjoys their company, may have celebrated the Sabbath at a local synagogue. The Bible doesn't say that, but it's likely that, uh, that he, he uh, celebrated the Sabbath in, uh, in worship there in Bethany. He's anointed by Mary for his uh, coming death. And then let's take a look at John 12, 9. John 12, 12, 9. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. Like, Jesus is popular, but we also would love to see this Lazarus fellow, this guy that was once dead, for four days and has been raised to new life. So, so, so the crowd uh, begins to assemble in Bethany. That's really the crowd that we're talking about. So Bethany is numbers people. You remember how far Bethany is from Jerusalem? Two? Two. I got two. I don't know. We're all over the place. Two miles from Jerusalem. So Jesus <laughs> mingled. Yeah, 12 was the hike from Jericho to Bethany. I, listen, I don't blame you. I don't, the, blame, the blame is on one person here this morning, right? Okay, so, but I'm, I, didn't, I, didn't, I wouldn't have remembered the 12 had you not said that, right? So Bethany is two miles from Jerusalem. So Jesus is mingling, hanging out with the crowd on Saturday night. So now we get to Palm Sunday, verse 12, the triumphant entry of Jesus. This is, of course, Sunday. Um, this is what we celebrate today. This is what this is all about. If you didn't get the memo and you don't know by now, all right? So here's what the scripture says. The next day, which would have been Sunday, the great crowd had come for the feast. So that is the feast of Passover. Uh, they had heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. Verse 13. Yeah. <laughs> I looked up, then I looked at you, then I said, verse 13, uh, she's taking notes. Uh, they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. 
Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it as it is written. Verse 15. Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him, right? They didn't even get it at the time. And that they had done these things to him. Verse 17, now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had given this miraculous sign, went out to meet him. Well, that makes sense, right? So the Pharisees said to one another, the religious leaders said to one another, see, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So we see that the dirty Pharisees are still scheming and plotting. And uh, so a couple things that I want to mention there. So they're waving palm branches. So palm branches are a sign of victory. It started way before this. It was customary. Um, I don't want to get into that in, in great detail. There's much more that we could say about that. But it's sort of the reception that you give a conquering king or a military hero. That's kind of the reception that they gave Jesus. Now, we've been saying for weeks that the reason or one of the reasons that so many people missed it when Jesus came along, he was interested in your heart. He was interested in what's going on on the inside. And they were looking for a military leader to overthrow Rome and bring Israel to a place of prominence. Their, their mindset and their thinking, uh, their perspective and what they were looking for, they just completely missed it. And so they're celebrating Jesus as the Messiah, as a conquering hero. They're celebrating him as the new king, right? So, so they get it at this point, sort of. They didn't know how this week was going to play out. Um, so they're, they're giving him the celebration that they would give a military leader. And they're laying down palm branches. They're laying down their garments for him to, uh, to travel upon as he's, as he's on this young donkey. And they're shouting, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the king of Israel. Now we mentioned the donkey. And this is a young donkey. Donkeys sort of have a reputation, don't they? Like there's a, like there's a thing that, that the, the King James calls a donkey that is the reason we can't use King James anymore <laughs> if you're a kid and you can't get into the Bible and you're just like I just can't get into it then just read the King James and you can snicker and giggle every time they say donkey right um, and uh, you know uh, sometimes referred to as a jackass which I love uh, using in when needed because it sounds like you're cussing but you're not some of you are switching churches. Yeah, that's the... I'm sure the mic didn't pick that up for those of you online. That's worthy of repetition. Someone says, that's the dream. Find words that have the same kind of punch as a cuss word, but you're not really cussing, right? Uh, so, so usually we say donkey. They have a reputation for being stubborn. And a young donkey isn't any less, right? So that's significant. So Jesus is on a young donkey donkey. There's more that I'd, I'd love to tell you about that, but it also demonstrates his mastery over nature, right? He's on an untrained, I mean, even a trained donkey is a mess, right? But here's an untrained young donkey that, that, that is seemingly obeying uh, Jesus' commands and doing what he wants it to do. So Jesus is intentionally communicating to them. He's not coming in on a stallion or a war horse with armor. He's entering the city uh, in humility, receiving the hero's welcome, but on this young, lowly donkey, and notably fulfilling Zechariah's prophecy at the same time. Someone has noted that, notice there is tension in the story. There are crowds of supporters a throng of worshipers and people clamoring after Jesus and his attention. This is the apex uh, in Jesus' ministry. He never had more followers than he had at this moment. This is the, this is the greatest amount of, of worship um, and acceptance that Jesus had in his entire earthly ministry. But mixed in the crowd are also his opponents. Um, 
Someone said that John does a good job of describing the high points while, while forecasting the low points that are coming shortly. All right, and then Luke 19, we'll look at Luke, who goes on to tell a little bit more of the story. And I'll, I think I'll cut this short. We won't read this whole thing, but um, even though Patty took 45 minutes to put all of these verses in there. Um, but look, <laughs> an hour and a half. Uh, Luke took 19, uh, sorry, Luke 19.41 says that as he approached Jerusalem, Luke tells a part of the story um, that's not in the previous passage that we were looking at. As he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city <clears throat> and he wept over it and said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it is hidden from your eyes. He goes on to prophesy himself about the destruction of Jerusalem, which would happen in 70 AD by the Romans. Jerusalem endured several beatings. And uh, we know historically that, that, that what he said would happen uh, also took place. But he's weeping because they don't recognize the Messiah. He's seeing the celebration. Palm branches are everywhere. People are ecstatic. And, and he knows that in a few days they're going to turn against him. So then later that day on Palm Sunday, he enters the temple according to the scriptures. He, he enters the temple and he begins driving out those that were selling. He speaks and says that it's written um, and he says to them that my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. Love to talk about that a little bit more. Um, time does not permit. Um, there, there were those in the temple area um, some have compared it to church. It's not exactly church, but you could say it's sort of like the church. And, uh, and they were ripping people off in there. Um, we've talked about this before. Uh, no time for the details, but somebody said, you know, can you sell something? Can you, can you have a bookstore? We used to have a bookstore uh, at, at uh, Lakeside. Just, you know, we sold our, our Christian books. And, you know, some people had a problem with that. We, can you sell things in God's house? That's not what Jesus was opposed to. Uh, what he was opposed to was they were taking advantage of people. Long story short, they were taking advantage of people and ripping people off. Um, it's okay to have fundraisers for the, for the church, the body of Christ, and that kind of thing. That's not what Jesus was upset about. Um, people were using religious language, religious stuff to take advantage of their brothers and sisters. And so he cleanses the temple, turns over the tables. Um, I mean, it's quite a display. Can you imagine Jesus, meek and mild Jesus, is, is getting violent and getting physical in the place. He was enraged that they would uh, be abusing God's worshipers and taking advantage of, him, of them in the way that they were. So, on Palm Sunday, here's the summary. On Palm Sunday, here's what happened. Jesus received praise as he rode into Jerusalem. He also wept over the destruction of Jerusalem and of the people uh, and of the city itself. And he also cleansed the temple. So I'll just encourage you later on today as, as you are reflecting upon Holy Week and, and, and what's going on this week, um, remember that, that Jesus received the accolades, uh, accepted the accolades, accepted the worship. He wept over how folks wouldn't accept him and then he cleansed the temple. All right, here we go. We're going we're, we're gonna to pick up speed. Do you think we can pick up speed? All right, it's probably, pro I see some heads. I see some, some doubters in the place. I, th I think you're probably right, but we're going to try anyway. All right, so Monday. So this is going to be, this is gonna be uh, you know, our heads are going to be spinning. But uh, I, for one, like we read these details from different passages, and I, I love having the sequence and the order of events. And the paper that we handed out, I didn't put any fancy fonts on there or, or even any color. <laughs> uh, but, but if you hang on to that, you know, that's something that, that you can, uh, years to come, reflect on what is happening with, with each day during Holy Week. So let's talk about, we can knock out a couple days at once here. Monday through Wednesday, he taught the crowds in the temple and he taught his disciples in Bethany. Luke 19 47. Should we stand up and stretch? Do we need to stand up and stretch? All right. Should we get all of our yawns out? <laughs> all right. So the progress is good. Looking at, looking at my notes, the pro it's okay. Don't be nervous. 
Luke 19, 47. Every day he was teaching in the temple, but the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were trying to kill him. Yet they could not find a way to do it because all the people hung on his word. So Monday through Wednesday, he had kind of the, the same practice. He follows, a, he follows a routine. He sleeps overnight in Bethany, and then he walks two miles into town in the morning. And then during the day, he teaches at the temple, he heals the sick, and he spars with the religious leaders where they try to give him questions and try to make him look bad. And how many of you know, they never make him look bad. He only looks better and better and better as they desperately try to discredit him. <clears throat> then he returns to Bethany for the evening. All right, Monday through Wednesday. Look how fast we did Monday through Wednesday. You weren't expecting that, were you? All right, uh, then we get up to what is uh, often called Monday Thursday. How many, of you, how many of you were confused by that when you were a kid? All right. It's not Monday Thursday. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, it was probably, we were probably a decade into uh, Lakeside Family Church until somebody told me, dude, it's not Monday Thursday. It's Monday. Monday Thursday. M-A-U-N-D-A-Y. Monday Thursday. Um, I never taught that it was Monday Thursday. Okay. Um, but on Thursday, Jesus changes his pattern. His confrontations with the religious leaders uh, have uh, escalated until finally he knows they're, they're looking out for him and he's got some more things to do before they seize him, arrest him, and, and crucify him. And so he kind of lays low on Thursday and, uh, and, and he just hangs out in Bethany on Thursday morning. All right, I'm looking for things that I can cut out. Um, all right, let's take a look at Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Luke tells us that now the feast of unleavened bread, called the Passover, was approaching. And the chief priests and teachers of the law were looking for some way to get rid of Jesus, for they were afraid of the people, right? That's why they're looking, they're trying to find some way. So then Jesus is making arrangements to celebrate the Passover meal. If you were here last week, you'll recall that the story of the Bible is the story of the Lamb. And Jesus is the Lamb of God. And in case we didn't, in case we didn't communicate it clearly enough last week, we'll just visit it uh, again today, that, that Jesus' death and his crucifixion as the Lamb of God took place at the same time that Passover lambs were being slain all throughout Israel. The imagery is unmistakable. Jesus is the Lamb of God that causes the judgment of God to pass over each and every one of us. So Jesus is actually celebrating Passover with his, with his disciples. I mean, what a, what a setup, right? I mean, this is, I mean, only God could plan things in the way that he, in the way that, that this is planned. So he sends the disciples to make preparations, and he didn't tell them, uh, he didn't tell most of the disciples even uh, where this was going to take place, where they were going to celebrate the Passover meal, because Judas, he knows what Judas is planning. And if Judas gets a hold of him, and uh, the Romans get a hold of him before the right time, uh, we're, we're outside of God's timing. And so um, a, a preparation for the Passover meal is being made. They asked Jesus, um, hey, where, where is this? Where is it going to take place? And he's like, I'll give you instructions as we, as we go along. By the way, Monday means, I don't know what, what word it comes from or what language it comes from, but it means commandment Thursday. Wondered that for quite some time. Commandment Thursday, because Jesus says, I give you a new command that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. And by this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Make no mistake about it. There are New Testament commandments. Come on, somebody, right? And, uh, and Jesus gives them this new command. Hey, love one another. That sounds kind of easy to do unless you know human beings. Right? Like, oh, couldn't you just give us some more religious stuff to do? Because loving people is, is, can be pretty difficult. Right? But so that's what Monday Thursday means, commandment Thursday. 
is where that, where that comes from. All right. So Jesus sends Peter and John saying, go and make preparations for us to eat the Passover. Where do you want us to prepare it, they ask. Jesus, Jesus replies, as you enter the city, a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him to the house that he enters and say to the owner of the house, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I may eat Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large upper room, all furnished, make preparations there. So every, again, everybody doesn't know where pa the Passover meal is going to take place. Uh, someone said this is very cloak and dagger. Jesus being very secretive about this. He doesn't want anybody to know where he's going to uh, have this meal, celebrate this meal until it's the right time because he knows that Judas is, is up to something. The scriptures go on to say that they left and found things just as Jesus had told them. So they prepared the Passover. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table and, said, and, he, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat Passover with you before I suffer. So again, I hope this week you'll look over these passages. You'll take some time and, and, uh, and, and meditate on what Jesus was doing on each day of this Holy Week. All right, in summary, all right, where are we at? Palm Sunday, you got it, Palm Sunday? Worship, crying over destruction, and cleansing the temple. Monday through Wednesday, teaching, making, <laughs> making religious people angry, <laughs> right? Monday, Thursday, he's laying low in Bethany, keeping a low profile, celebrating the Last Supper, giving uh, instructions to his disciples, uh, also praying in the garden when he is arrested by the temple guard. All right, we are right on schedule. <sighs> okay, breathe. Got to take a second to breathe. It's only my fourth breath this whole sermon, so I need a minute. All right, then Good Friday. So now we're, now we're up to Good Friday. By the way, we are going to have a service on Good Friday. If you're not familiar with that, it's something that, uh, that we came up with here at Lakeside. I'm saying we because I want credit. Um, it really, really wasn't my, really wasn't my idea, but it's cool. And so uh, the worship team is, is uh, we play. It, most of you were here for that last year. Many of you were. Um, we play some secular music that we have matched to scenes from. We pulled scenes and imagery from different um, movies uh, from that depict the crucifixion. I think last year I said, yeah, we're watching movies of the crucifixion and somebody, you know, like, what, the real one? They didn't, no, it's not, <laughs> it's actors, it's actors, it's not, it's not, the, very few smartphones back there, back <laughs> 2,000 years ago to, to, re, to record all the happenings. But, but we pulled different uh, images from different uh, various movies about uh, the, uh, the last week of Jesus' life, and so we're not, we're not, you know, obviously this is, it has an evangelistic thrust to it, so we're playing uh, secular music as it matches, and boy, oh boy, I, have to, I don't know if anybody's with me, but a lot of these songs, we're like, okay, that's a good match, that, that kind of fits the scene, yeah, uh, maybe we'll change a word here, that doesn't make sense, but we changed a couple words, we took some liberties there, but uh, now, if, if I'm, it's been a few times, I'm in the grocery store, or I'm somewhere, and I hear these secular songs, and I'll tell you the power of that Good Friday service, like I'm, I'm, I'm seeing Jesus in my mind's eye when I hear these other songs that, that, you, just, that you just hear in, in life. So I'd encourage you to come and to be a part of that. Uh, that is a good time, and the worship team works, uh, and has worked really hard on that, uh, but I think you will be blessed by it. Um, so Good Friday. You, you, you probably know what happens on Good Friday. Jesus endures six trials. Can I just summarize this for you? We're not going to go through this in detail. That was a few weeks ago we did that. Uh, but Jesus endured six trials. He was mocked, beaten, and crucified. And then the sins of the entire world were laid upon him. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. And then he takes a thief on the cross to paradise. So Jesus endured six trials between 2 a.m. and 8 a.m. A.M. at the hands of the Roman government, and uh, sorry, three trials with the Romans and three at the hands of the Jewish government. 
All six trials were on trumped up charges. And many of them were held illegally and none of them uh, had substantiating witnesses to support what they were, uh, what they were trying to, to uh, get rid of Jesus with, um, which was a requirement of Jewish law. Um, as I was preparing this, I saw once again, I take note every time I see this, that between the trials, Jesus was beaten by Roman soldiers, and one author said uh, 39 times. So 40 minus 1, uh, that was a law. I don't know if it's a law, but it was something that the Jews did was 40 times was a appropriate for some punishment. But if you wanted to show mercy to someone, you would give them 39 lashes. And so that kind of became a common thing. So you can whip somebody 39 times and still feel pretty good about yourself, right? Aren't I merciful? Could have whipped you 40 times. I stopped at 39 because I'm just good like that, right? Um, that's often mentioned around this time of year, but that is a practice that the Jews practiced. The Romans did things a little differently. And remember that the abuse and the beating that Pilate gave to Jesus was an attempt to so severely beat him that, that Pilate could get out of this, you know, that Pilate could wash his whole hands of this whole situation. So it's, I'm of the belief, and other scholars, other scholars? I'm of the belief, I'm not going to include myself with scholars, but uh, scholars are, many scholars are as well, that the Romans beat him far beyond 39. That was a Jewish thing. He's in the hands of the Romans. So uh, he was beaten to what we saw Isaiah said was beyond recognition that he didn't even look human after the abuse that he endured. He was mocked, a crown of thorns was placed on his head, and he was crucified between th two thieves. All right. We can just skip Saturday. What, <laughs> what happened on Saturday? Not a lot. I mean, I don't know. Uh, traditionally, um, it has been believed that Jesus descended into the depths, descended into Abraham's bosom, de descends into um, a, a, a holding place of the righteous dead. This is going to take too long if I explain it. Just, you got to trust me. <laughs> um, I don't know how to... If I said, if I said Hades, Hades... Right, our mind goes to our, our mind goes to something. Uh, that's a Greek word for a holding place of the deceased. Now we think of Hades as a place for the evil dead. Right, uh, Hades can describe just a place of the dead. Okay, so it is believed by many, myself included, that that without Jesus. Even those observant Jews, good folks, without Jesus, they didn't, get, they didn't enter heaven, right? There was a holding place for them. Now, it wasn't flames licking at their bodies, and it wasn't uh, a torment that lasted for eternity. That's a, different, uh, that's, a, that's a different floor of hell, if you will, right? Um, so Hades, uh, don't think of Hades as punishment and, and flames and, and torture. Hades is a holding place or the dead, including what we would call the righteous dead, right? So it is believed by many, and traditionally um, the, the church held, the body of Christ held, that Jesus descended into a, a, a holding place for the righteous dead and delivered them out of there and into heaven. You know, you don't make it to heaven without Jesus, even if you're righteous without Jesus. Uh, they, they weren't in torment, they weren't in punishment, but they also weren't in God's presence. And so Jesus descends on Saturday. Uh, his body is in the tomb. He descends and liberates those righteous Jews, um, the righteous dead, from a holding uh, department, compartment, a holding room doesn't quite say it, um, a holding place. For the righteous dead and leads what what ephesians calls captivity captive yes. 
So they're, they're, they're righteous. It's, it's, a, it's, a fine, it's a fine place, but it's not in God's presence, and, and it's not heaven. And so Jesus redeems even the righteous dead from generations before his earthly ministry. Now, that's the view that many uh, held for generations. Um, the people are starting to rethink that. I found four different interpretations of this idea of what Jesus was doing on Saturday. I encourage you, study it out, and then come back and tell me. Would you just come? You figure it out. Like, why should I have to do all the heavy lifting? You can read. You, f you figure it out. I mean, three of them are pretty good. The fourth one, I think, is a stretch. But somebody that I really, really respect said the fourth one. It's, uh, I don't know. So I went with the traditional kind of view on that. But we know that the body of Jesus was in the tomb. That's what took place on the Sabbath. I don't want to get into the other interpretations. I do, but I'm fighting it. I'm, fi I'm fighting temptation right here in front of you. Right? Like, I want to, <laughs> I want to share it, but, but it's, it's been tough enough already. Don't you think it's been hard enough already? All right. Now, I don't want to give anything away. I don't want to give away the surprise. <laughs> but next week, we're going to celebrate something very special. <laughs> right. Oh, my years. I don't think I've ever said that. Do you remember, if you've ever seen, if you've ever seen The Passion of Christ... Um, just, I mean, just so well done. And I, I, this will never happen to me again in my life. I'm, I'm sure of it. It'll never happen to me. I saw it in the theater. I went there with, with four preachers, which made it worse, I think, right? So um, I don't know. It was just, it was, it, it was intense. And you're sitting there with all these preachers too. So I don't know. That, they, just, they just made it even more intense. And I was so drawn into, I know there's many that haven't seen it because it's, it's, tough. it's a lot. It's a lot to take. Um, but I was so drawn into the story. I don't want to say that I, my, my theology was shipwrecked and that I, you know, that I lost my salvation for a moment, but I was so gripped by the movie that, that when it shows Jesus in his resurrected state, I was like, oh, yeah, good, good ending, right? You've just watched, you've just watched some, some, pretty, some pretty horrible things happen to a pretty awesome savior, right? And, and uh, I don't know that I, that I that, like Mel Gibson fooled me. He fooled me, like he, he I was so gripped that I, that I wasn't, it's not that I forgot, but I wasn't thinking about it. Like I wasn't watching it going, it's okay, he comes back, it's okay. He's gonna come back from this, it's all right. That myself and those that I was, really the whole theater. Uh, anybody see it in the theater? Brave class, that's a, I mean, that's a special, special group right there. Um, it was just so gripping that, that when it shows the resurrected Christ, I mean, it, it, it's, it's not quite the same feeling that the disciples had, but, but you're, it, I mean, I was shook up, right? So, so uh, I don't want to give away the secret, but, but Jesus does come back. We'll, and we'll celebrate that more on that next week. Um, and I, I've got some, some notes on that, but I don't think that is necessary. Um, the scriptures predicted, the prophets foretold. We're up to uh, several prophets. Now, we've been focusing mainly on Isaiah, but we've looked at others as well. Uh, and, and we could look at others. We won't do that. Um, but it was predicted centuries before it happened. It was beheld by, these events were beheld by several eyewitnesses. They were recorded for posterity. And we are the recipients of the blessings of Christ. At Easter, we celebrate Jesus as the Son of God, as the crucified Lord, as the suffering servant, as the Lamb who was slain. He's also the resurrected Savior and the ascended Savior. He's the living one who was dead and lives forevermore. And he is someone that you can trust with your life today. I'll close with this. If you think salvation, if you think eternal life, being a Christian, going to heaven, there's a number of ways that we could say it. If you think that's determined by how good of a person that you are, 
or you keeping all the rules, or you keeping all the commandments, you, you keeping all the laws, you being a good person. If you being a good person got you into, uh, earned eternal life for you, then Jesus never had to show up. The reality is, and, and this could, I mean, we could spend years uh, discussing the number of scripture that share with us the reality that none of us were or even could be good enough to deserve and earn God's favor and his forgiveness because he's a holy God. But because he loves us, he provided a way for each and every one of us. I know it sounds trite, but it's not what you know. It literally and really is who you know. Jesus has already conquered death. I haven't even faced it yet, but Jesus has already conquered death. And he stands extending to me the gift of eternal life, free of charge. He paid the price. I can't add to it. I can't, I can't throw a tip on top. There's nothing I can do to earn my salvation. Jesus offers it free because he paid the price for it and only he could. Yes. If you're, with, if you're uh, with us this morning, either online or in this place, I just want to ask you to just to bow your heads and, and close your eyes. And, and maybe this morning you would say, you know what? I, 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 I believe in Jesus. I, I believe in God. But I didn't understand that he paid the price for me. That anything and everything I've ever done has been forgiven through the cross and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You know, when we go through life hoping that someday on the scales of God's justice, we're hoping that our good deeds will outweigh our bad deeds. And when we approach life that way, we never, ever, ever have certainty. I mean, it would take extraordinary arrogance to have certainty. Oh, for sure, my good will outweigh my bad. If we're living our lives hoping that we're good enough, that our good outweighs our bad, then you need to understand the scriptures tell us it doesn't work like that. But you don't have to go through life uncertain. You don't have to go through life wondering. You don't have to go through life hoping that you've done enough good things to counteract the bad things. Because if we place our trust in Christ and in Christ alone, we have confidence and certainty an assurance that we've inherited eternal life. And we can say that because it's not based on what we've done. I just accept it. I just accept it. I could never get to heaven on my own. But if we trust Jesus, he says to us, like he said to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me in paradise. I want to encourage you with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you would just repeat this prayer after me. I'm just going to pray. These aren't magic words. But if this, exp if this expresses and is the thought and the intent of your heart, I would encourage you just to repeat this prayer after me. We, we normally say it out loud. I just want to do it different today. You just pray this just pray this inwardly. The Lord hears you. We could talk about the theology of that. If you want to debate that later, we can. I'll just encourage you to pray with me. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for me, and I believe that you rose for me. 
And I want to live for you. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin and everything I've, I've ever done wrong. Fill me with your spirit and help me to live for you. Be my Lord, be my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you, uh, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, maybe you're online, you prayed that prayer for the first time, you can contact, contact somebody. Tell somebody that you prayed that prayer. Um, I encourage you to, to contact us here at Lakeside. Uh, we would love to share more with you about um, your, a new walk. And walk means lifestyle. It's a, it's a Christian way of saying lifestyle. Uh, a new walk with God through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're in the room here this morning. I want to encourage you to, uh, we'll have some folks up here um, to, uh, for prayer at the end of service. And maybe just come and, and share with them. Say, hey, I, I prayed that prayer for the first time. What do I need to do next? I, I wanna, I'm going to start this Christian life. What, what do I need to do next? I want to encourage you to do that. How many of you, uh, I know there's a few. The 12 comes back to mind. The miles that Jesus marched uphill to Bethany from Jericho. I think I got that right. I didn't even look at the notes. I mean, you, just, you saw it. I didn't even look at the notes. 12 miles uphill, right? Um, that sounds like a lot. But Grayson is going to hike and march up a lot more hills than that. And he's going at least like, I don't know, 14, 15 miles <laughs> or something like that. Grayson, how many miles are you going? 2200. Oh, only 2,200. So 2,200, 2,200 miles. So if you didn't know, Grayson and, and his brother are doing this, this thing that we all should do. We should all just get around to it. Um, going to hike the Appalachian Mountains. And uh, it's going to take, do we know for sure? <laughs> I think I heard six months. I think I heard six months in there. I have... I have no way of knowing how long it takes to, how many, I've already forgotten, how many miles, how many miles? Uh, almost 2,200. Almost 20, okay, almost 2,200. So I think it, maybe, maybe we should, uh, maybe we should pray for grace. And, and this is the last we'll see you before you go, right? So uh, how about we, uh, how about we pray for Grayson and uh, this journey? He didn't ask for this, but. Uh, I thought it would be a good idea. Okay, someone else asked me to do this. Um, none of your business. It doesn't matter who. It doesn't matter who. Maybe somebody who, you know, just would like you to come back safely. <laughs> and, that's, and that's all of us. So, uh, I don't know, if, you're, if you want to, he doesn't know what we're doing, but if you want to, just surround him. And if you just want to lay hands on him, everybody's not comfortable with that. Everybody doesn't want to do that. Um, some people, even from the other side of the room, are already moving. You are loved. Um, and uh, if you just, I mean, if you, if you feel comfortable doing that, um, would, you, uh, would you take just a moment and pray with us and, uh, and ask God to bring our brother back? I mean, I don't know how good the internet is there in the Appalachian Mountains, but uh, I don't know if you're going to be, if you're able to watch us on Sunday morning. We need to get the, we need to get the, uh, the mic working on the other side. I wonder if we could work on that. Because if I don't hear his laugh at my jokes for six months, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know. It's just going gonna, gonna to ruin everything for all of us. Um, but could we, lift up, could we lift up Grayson um, this morning? Heavenly Father, we, uh, we want to thank you for the opportunity. Everyone doesn't have the opportunity to go with their brother and, and hike over 2,200 miles through the Appalachian Mountains. Um, just a, a rare... And just what a unique opportunity. I think it'd be amazing. I think it'd be such a good, I've already begun strategizing. How can I pull that off? How can I get away with that? Um, I just think that'd be so cool. So, so Lord, we're, we're grateful for the opportunity. At the same time, we know that his family will miss him. And, you know, let's be honest. Um, it's more than just missing him. I, I'm sure uh, 
that Danielle is concerned. I mean, it's, uh, it's not a perfect world, as you may have heard a couple times here in church. You know, it's a fallen world. I'm sure she uh, has some, uh, some concerns about not, not uh, seeing him for that long a period of time. And so, Lord, we also just pray for his safety. Lord, I pray that he'll make a deeper and a stronger connection with you. But, but, uh, but Lord, also, um, it's, it's, uh, it's awesome to have two parents around. I mean, if there's, if there's going to be just one parent, we're glad that it's a mom, right? Like, that's if, if one can step up and do the job of two, uh, that's, that's probably, I mean, moms are, are good like that. I heard a, a wise man once say that that a mom and a dad almost make up one whole sane person, right? So, so there'll be challenges on uh, Danielle and all the children's part as well. It's not going to be easy for them. They'll, they'll not only miss him, but uh, it'll be tough for them. So Lord, I pray for your grace on the family um, as, uh, as they certainly miss dad and, and uh, miss his presence. Um, but Lord, I also just pray that your, your grace would equip them and help them. And, uh, and the Lord, that, they would, that you would just minister to them throughout this time. Lord, I pray that you give uh, Grayson the experience of a lifetime. He's had a lot of amazing experiences. Um, Lord, I just pray that you would minister to him, uh, do some awesome things, um, speak to him, minister to him, and... Uh, Keep him, keep him safe. Bring him back to us safely. Um, and in uh, any area that, that unforeseen that we might not know to specifically pray for, Lord God, we just ask that you would, uh, that you would go before him and his brother. That I pray that you would give them uh, great wisdom. We talked about that some time ago, that it's seeking you for wisdom and, and on their behalf, I just invite you to dispense wisdom upon them and uh, that you would lead them and that you would guide them and uh, protect them. Send your spirit and angelic beings alongside to keep them safe. Um, Lord, we thank you. We give you thanks and praise. And Lord, we have confidence that because we've asked that you have also heard and have answered. We give you praise and thanks in Jesus' awesome and mighty name. Amen. Amen. All right. Praise the Lord. Well, Grayson, if that wasn't okay, not my fault. <laughs> but, a good, but, a, but the right move, right? A good idea. Um, Kenny is going to share something with you. I can tell by yeah, his body language and the way he's charged. <laughs> hey, good morning, Lakeside Family Church. Good, good to see you. Um, just a couple quick announcements. While it's all I do is help stall while these guys get set up. But uh, 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 <laughs> Pastor already mentioned it. Uh, this coming Friday uh, is the Good Friday service, seven o'clock. Yes. Yes. Seven, seven o'clock. Um, so come, come for that uh, for a, a good time, uh, a good Friday, if you will. Um, and then uh, uh, Sunday, next week Sunday, is uh, Resurrection Sunday. Um, so be here, uh, bring, bring some of the, what do they call those people that only come at Christmas and oh, yeah. Easter? There's some derogatory names. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Bring, bring some of them, you know, it's Easter, it's uh, Resurrection Sunday. I, I'm not going to say Easter, I don't like that makes me think of the bunny and the eggs and right. stuff. I'd rather say Resurrection yeah. Sunday. Yeah. Um, but uh, Toy Petty said uh, to make sure to tell everyone, come early, uh, maybe like 9.15, 9.30. Uh, there will be a little continental breakfast out there in the cafe for us to munch on. Um, and then, uh, then we'll party it up for Resurrection Sunday. Um, and then the last uh, thing, if Patty, if you got it ready, uh, we have a video announcement for, uh, well, you'll see.
like there's quite a few ladies signed up and people signing up to bring a guest um, but if you need questions see somebody out there or see Clark Eddy um, to have your questions answered um, and I think that's all I was gonna say all right, all right. that's great <laughs> awesome thank you Kenny yep. all right well done uh, well we'll close with the song here I'll just remind you that uh, that we have been placing offering plates near the exits. Are we still doing that? Because I haven't checked in. Okay, all right. I haven't checked in with that in quite some time. Like the last few weeks, I'm like, are we still? I uh, need to ask somebody. Um, and uh, and so we just uh, want to remind you that uh, we uh, that the scriptures encourage uh, giving to the ministry. That you're not paying for the sermon. Amen. Just so you know. It's not what this is, because because we don't want to see our offerings go down. All right, you are you are sowing uh, seed into the ministry, right? Uh, and uh, blessing blessing the ministry. Church is free. Thank God for that. Aren't you glad for that? Like, how many of you know? Like, if you don't have anything to give, you should still show up. Yes. Oh, you didn't know that I knew that. Like when we were passing the plate, you didn't know. You didn't know that uh, I knew. That sometimes people go, I don't have much to give, so I'm just not going to go. Huh. Anybody want to admit it? I felt the same way before. We want you in the body. Come on, somebody, yes. right? Yes. Like, and I, and, I, and I like, amen. And I like that we've been putting offering plates in the back. It's, it's uh, nobody has to feel like, well, you know, people are seeing what I'm giving or seeing that I'm giving or whatever. So. I don't know how many times I've heard it, and I've, I've felt it myself in years past. Um, if you don't have anything to give, you're not, there's no entrance fee, right, right? To, uh, to Lakeside. Um, and uh, that makes it even more amazing that you bless and that you sow into the ministry. We're not a give to get ministry, but we do teach, because the Bible teaches, that if you give, that the Lord will bless you. Right. Anybody believe that in the place? Yes. Oh, here I'm talking about the mic. Uh, all that other stuff I said without the mic is pretty good. Um, <laughs> but I'm not rehashing that. Uh, so God bless you. We appreciate you so much. We ask for God's blessing on uh, the what you give and uh, on the gift and the giver in Jesus' name. Amen. So thank you so much. You guys are awesome. Uh, all right. Well, let's close with a song, yeah? Yes. All right.
I see you do that. 